contained in the staff report, along with any written comments and input that has been received through the public notification process for the application. The quasi judicial hearing procedure the Commission will follow is set out in state law and the Oregon City Municipal Code, and the hearing procedure steps are shown on the chart to my right. Anyone who wishes to speak should fill out a slip and give it to the planning staff before the hearing or before you speak. All letters, reports, and pictures must be marked as an exhibit by the planning staff before they can be submitted into the record. For the public record, please begin all your testimony by stating your name and address or city of residence. Testimony and evidence should be directed toward the applicable uh, approval criteria. If you believe other criteria apply in addition to those, uh, address in the staff report, identify and discuss those criteria, and explain why you believe they apply to the application under consideration this evening. A person does not have to testify in order to submit written materials of any length while the public record is open on this application. However, any party wishing for a continuance or to keep the public record open must make that request before the public hearing is closed. If the Planning Commission makes a decision with which you disagree, any issue which you may wish to appeal must have been raised for the Commission's consideration. Without raising the issue on the record with sufficient specificity and accompanied by statements or evidence so that the City and all parties can respond, the issue will not be adjudged appealable to the State Land Use Court of Appeals. In addition, Oregon Revised Statutes 197-796 requires us to announce the following. The failure of an applicant to raise constitutional or other issues relating to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow the local government or its designee to respond to the issue precludes action for damage in certain court. At this time, I'll ask if any commissioners have any ex parte contact, conflict of interest, bias, or other statements to declare. I'm aware of the site. I've been around it. I haven't seen the edible plants, though, and I want to do that. Okay, the edible plants. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I'm aware of the site. I've uh, lived in the area for a number of years. I'm also familiar with a couple of individuals in the audience, but I don't believe that that will have any influence on my decisions. And I, of course, lived here for a long time, so I'm familiar with the site as well. Uh, and I uh, have served on committees with. Uh, Mr. Danielson in the past, and I've enjoyed every minute of that, but uh, I don't believe that will affect my decision this evening uh, or further on as we go through the process. Uh, anyone would like to question any of the commissioners on any of their statements this evening? All right, if seeing none, then we will move forward and uh, see the staff. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Powell. Good evening, commissioners, and welcome, everybody. Uh, tonight, staff will not be presenting a staff report and recommendation. Uh, this is basically going to be a show and tell. Uh, I'm going to briefly describe the application. It's a very large site. The application consists of a master development plan for a phased development and a detailed development plan for the grocery store and the associated parking. There are also some retail pads associated with this phase one detailed development plan. And the application consists of uh, a water resource overlay or natural resource overlay district review as well for the uh, uh, wetland that is on the site. So there are three applications bundled together. Uh, it's approximately 21 acres of land, very large site, and the redevelopment of it is pretty complex. There have been a number of revisions um, to the uh, parking lot and to the plazas and facades. And some of those revisions have not had time to be reviewed by uh, staff as well as the neighborhood associations and CIC. Um, and for that, we are recommending a continuance up, uh, to November the 8th, 2010, at which time we will present our staff report and uh, make a recommendation to the Planning Commission. The uh, staff report will be ready um, on November 1st on the city website and for everyone to see. The, as I said, the, uh, the master plan process allows you to do phasing um, up to a 20-year phase uh, development. And uh, it also allows the applicant to request certain adjustments from the city code. And so we're going to be going into those adjustments in detail at the next meeting. We're not going to go into those uh, at this meeting. Um, but you are welcome to ask any questions during this uh, hearing tonight, and we'll be available to answer those questions. Uh, I just want to direct you to some of the exhibits that are on your diet and on your screens. We've uploaded um, 
all of the exhibits that have been submitted to date and right up into uh, 5 p.m. this evening up to the dais. Uh, I'm just going to direct your attention to exhibits 17 through 20, uh, which are the uh, exhibit 17 is a bundle of uh, 12 support letters that have been submitted to city staff this week. Um, and then we have exhibit 18, which consists of an addendum document from the firm ESA uh, in response to uh, the review of the wetland um, code responses. And uh, so that's exhibit 18. Exhibit 19. Let's see. Applicant's PowerPoint presentation that I'll be presenting tonight. And exhibit 20 is a letter from uh, Jackie Hammond Williams, uh, which we received this afternoon. Um, so, without further ado, we did give you a large plan set to take home and review this evening. Let's see the large rolls. And um, so, that should be all the material that we've been submitted by the applicant. And, uh, and that's all I have for the moment. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I see there's no issue with planning. Uh, uh, we have a, uh, a letter in the record uh, extending the 120-day deadline. Um, and that was submitted into the record at a previous meeting. So it's all right. And uh, no, there's no timing issues. Um, we have, and I believe that extension is a two-week extension to the 120-day clock, but it takes us out into, I believe, mid-January. But I'll get back to you on that once I find the find the Okay, that's great. Thank you. Any other questions of staff before we move on to the applicant's presentation? Sure. Okay, very good. Uh, well, at this time, then, we'll have the applicant up for their presentation this evening, or applicants, or however we would do this. And if you introduce yourself and your city residents, please. Good evening, Chair Powell, uh, Planning Commissioners. My name is Jill Long. I'm with the law firm Lane Powell in Portland, Oregon. I'm going to just take a few minutes to introduce our team. This is Mark Pernaconi, and next to me is CE John Company. And Mark's the developer on the project, uh, representing the Danielson family, and I'm the attorney representing the Danielson family. Um, I want to take just a few minutes to thank staff. Uh, they've gotten very familiar with our team over the last uh, few months. We've been working really closely with them, and we know everyone's putting in long hours and a lot of hard work on this application, and we're very appreciative of that. And I'll just take a couple minutes to introduce our team that are sort of sitting here behind us. Um, they're not necessarily going to do presentations today, but if you do have technical questions, everybody's available to answer them. So please feel free to, to let us know. Uh, starting with Gary Rommel, uh, over in the right corner was Rommel Architecture. Uh, then we have Kevin Apperson and Dan Boltinghouse from WH Pacific. Uh, Chris Bremer with Kittleson and Associates, our traffic engineer. We've got Diane Phillips from Safeway. And of course, most importantly, we have Craig Danielson and Carol Suzuki, the owners of the property in the Danielson family. Uh, and I forgot one, sorry. And uh, we've also got Jack Dalton, our environmental engineer consultant. So if you've got the full technical team at your disposal mm -hmm. this evening, please feel free to stop us, ask questions, or ask for more information. Um, I'd like to take one more moment. We have a lot of folks in the audience that are here to support the project but don't want to testify, uh, don't feel comfortable with that. So I wanted to just give them a brief opportunity to stand and show their support. We'll recognize them. So please, those of you who asked if you could stand in support of the project this evening, please join us standing. Thank you very much. You can go ahead and sit down. Thank you for letting us see that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Mark's going to uh, walk you through the history of the site and give you a presentation of our project. And again, just let us know if you have questions. Thanks. Good evening. Thank you for hearing our application this evening. What um, I'd like to do this, this evening, rather than drag you through all the plans, which you can all look at probably in, in peace, or have or read the traffic report, or the traffic study. I think I'd like to spend some time talking about some of the challenges we faced and, and what we've done and why we produce what we produce to put before you tonight for approval or we'll get approved hopefully in two weeks. The, um, 
the initial slide kind of is the existing condition of the site. And it's kind of important to look at this because when, although there's a lot of complexities and nuances as we go through everything here, what really we're doing is taking the existing structure you see, and then I'm going to hopefully go over your head with this so everybody in the back knows what I'm talking about, is this structure, reconfigure the geometry of what's there and move it towards Beaver, Beaver Creek when we're all said and done. Um, We'll get into some of the parameters, but basically what's there now is, is almost a 100,000 square foot structure. We're going to be replacing with approximately 80,000 square foot structure and with an additional one, one additional pad as part of phase one, which again we'll clarify as we go through this. Um, we'll get the technology here. We've uh, made presentations to the Hillendale Neighborhood Association, the Gap and Lane Neighborhood Association, and the Citizens Involvement Council. Um, in several cases on numerous times. There has been some changes to the plan as we've gone along. And uh, nothing major, but there have been, again, small nuances as we've gone along through the design process. Just a little bit of history about of the site. <clears throat> the site was acquired by the Danielson family in 1974 from what I believe was a bowling alley on the corner of, of Warner Milne and Malala. Um, the site was developed, the initial structure with the Danielson's Thriftway, which over the years has been expanded uh, three times, and at one time included a 60,000 square foot superstore and 30,000 square foot grocery. And I believe that superstore sold everything from lumber to clothing to jewelry. Uh, as we go through the history of the site, in 1975, the U.S. Bank opened, it's still there today. 1976, Key Bank, or what, what at that time was First State Bank. 1979, the 25,000 square foot building opened, and I believe the Flores, Herb Flores, was the initial tenant and is still there today. In 1979, uh, the Center opened, and oddly enough, CE John Company uh, operated and built it and operated the State Center until the Danielson family purchased it and ran it themselves. In 1980, the smaller retail building opened. 1981, McDonald's opened, and it's still there today. 1992, the State Center closed, which I guess was the day Disco died here in Oregon City. <laughs> in 1976, the theater that's out there now opened on the same site. And in, in 2010, this year, the, the Gross the Danielson, now called Fresh Marketplace, closed. Although I heard the name never really stuck. It was called Danielson's Thriftwood. <laughs> Kind of walk around the site, the existing condition of the site. Uh, the four shots you're looking at are basically from Beaver Creek. Uh, Beaver Creek Road. Some things to, to kind of uh, just add to this the, the building predated Beaver Creek. So, as I understand, the, the, uh, the road wasn't even there when the center opened. Another thing is that this building is functionally obsolete as a grocery store, and uh, as you get into a newer, modern one, you'll see what some of the changes are, as well as I believe this building has went from a large use to multiple uses in, in a building that was built for a large use, which creates its own challenges as you go through history. A uh, couple shots of the building itself. Uh, as you can see, that building is kind of two-sided two-and-a-half-sided, where the west elevation really has no activity. The uh, south elevation is pretty much the low. So what's there now is, is probably uh, service use, and it's time for something new. Uh, let's move on to what, what we're proposing in phase one. Uh, again, the existing building was, was approximately 100,000 feet. We're proposing to replace that building with a, with a new grocery and new Safeway at about 55,700 feet. There's about 20, 22,000 square feet of small shops and about an eight, a pad of about 8,000 feet as part of phase one. The development cost is about 17 million, all private investment. It created about 200 new permanent jobs, about 100 construction jobs, and this project could start in next month and could be complete by late 2011. <clears throat> and here's a word, this center is still owned by the Danielson family, a local family from here in Oregon City, that's reinvesting in the property to, to kind of put it back in a new modern use. And, and that's a rare thing. A lot of these grocery anchor centers are owned by out-of-town investors, REITs, a group of dentists in Phoenix, uh, or even worse, uh, 
a fund run by some geniuses from Lehman Brothers. But what the point I'm trying to make is the reinvestment is not an easy thing. And as you get into some of the complexities of this, it doesn't happen very often. And there are a lot of challenges we had to make this work. And I just, I just take a minute and think about having the local family still here, still running the center, still reinvesting in the center. Because it is a rare thing and it's really a good thing. So, what I want to do is spend some time talking about what some of the complexities are. I, I kind of had this plan. Uh, this actually isn't in your package the way it looks up here because we're, we're trying to demonstrate something. I, I do this for a living. We redo a lot of old centers. And one of the biggest challenges you have in redoing an existing center is you can only redevelop what your leases allow you to redevelop. To say it simply, you can't tear down an existing tenant's building, you can't redo an existing tenant's site if their lease doesn't let you do so. I realize it's all owned by one owner, but that owner doesn't always have free reign of what he can do with all of his site as long as leases are in place. And the bigger the individual tenants are, the more complicated that site control gets. And some of that exists here. And I want to make it clear to everyone when you start seeing what the details of the plan are, why some things can be changed and why some things can't. And I realize we're in for a master plan approval, but the master plan deals with a couple of future paths. It isn't necessarily meaning we have the ability to impact every single part of the site. Now, the first slide kind of shows what the property is, no question. But what this slide shows you in the dark hatch areas are areas that we simply can't or don't have the discretion at this point to redevelop. The leases won't let us. And literally, the leases say you can't change parking configurations. You can't change access points. You can't change pedestrian access points without a major renegotiation of the lease. And the problem is, unless you can stabilize the lease negotiation part, you'll never get anywhere trying to redevelop these centers. Sometimes you have to do this over a long period of time. And even this proposal we have in front of you includes effectively three phases. It is certainly not the entire site that's, up, that's being redeveloped at this time. There will be future parts of the site to be redeveloped that will come in with other applications later, above and beyond this master plan approval. In addition to that, there's a few other challenges. As uh, I was explaining to me, at some point in time, an office complex was built to the west of the site. They got the office buildings, the Danielsons got the drainage dish. And that, that kind of yellowish area going across the parallel in Beaver Creek, part of it is a ditch, part of it's the culvert. But that's definitely an issue we had to deal with in trying to site this building. Uh, we can't be on it, obviously, for it's a culvert. And if you go to the west of where the Beaver Creek signal is, we also have some natural resources to deal with. And there's other utility issues, some of which are minor, some of which are, are significant relocation that are also on this drawing. But I want to just be clear if everybody understands that, because this, this applies to shopping malls, it applies to grocery anchor centers, it applies to strip centers. You don't always have the discretion to do anything you want at the site at any time, even if you own it. It's a complicated issue for landlords to have to deal with. If you have any questions, please ask me. I'd be more than happy to elaborate what that means. Jill's the lawyer. She understands it even better than I do. Uh, the proposed site plan, we're a little sorted here on our screen, but the proposed site plan, um, oh, let me back up one second. There's another interesting challenge, which this, this map has been posted a little bit so it faces straight north. As you see, we have kind of a, the original building that was there oriented itself to the Malala axis. We're trying to orient more to Beaver Creek, however, we don't have a nice 90 degree corner. Uh, Beaver Creek and does a nice little curve for us, and it doesn't give us a nice edge to be up against, especially when most of the site that's existing, meaning McDonald's, Key Bank, U.S. Bank, all orient towards Malala. And, and that's the way the parking runs in those existing parts. And that's the way the access roads run in the existing parts. So those are some of the constraints we have as we lay out our building. Here's the site plan we're proposing. Um, again, I'm going to shoot over your head for a second so everybody understands. This is the Safeway, the new Safeway grocery. 
These are the shop buildings we're wrapping along the east and the south side of the ocean. The phase one pad is this particular pad right here at the Beaver Creek entry, which is part of our phase one. Future phases are right here is phase two, and right here is phase three. Now, phase three is a long ways off and depends on what happens with certain leases, but the, some of the traffic impacts are, are incorporated into this particular application for both this pad and this pad. No buildings or sites are proposed at this time. The development itself is what's kind of wrapped around in this red line. It, it involves some issues related to Malala signal intersection and an awful lot of the Beaver Creek frontage. We have some interesting interfaces, but again, I, I want you to try to remember as we get into some design details probably at our next meeting. For instance, right now this is an open field, and this is the existing theater parking that we have to somehow link together to make a functional parking solution. We have an interface up here with an existing 25,000 square foot resale building where it's going to interface with brand new parking down here, some of which is existing, but most of it's reoriented to work for the grocery store. Again, these are some of our challenges. We're right up against the tip of this drainage easement as we look right here. And what we did here, and again, I'm going to, your, your code has lots and lots of words. We're not going to repeat them all tonight. But there are some key words that I want you to keep in mind, which we use as we lay this out. Now, it's section 17, 62055. Is, is the second dealing with most of the project site, the building site. And there's two words that are in the purpose statement. And to me, a word in the purpose statement is an overarching word that should ripple through the rest of the code. And that's functional and cohesive. And that's some of the challenges we're facing here. For instance, I, I would hope no one in this building thinks if you put, if you face retail here on Beaver Creek, that the foot traffic on Beaver Creek is sustain that retail. I don't think the traffic council will ever show that. I've never shown it in the past and probably will never show it in the future. Nor is there parking along Beaver Creek to support that retail. So what we did is we added the parking function to service the retail that does face Beaver Creek, which is what's right here. At the same time, again, function and cohesiveness. The grocery store, we've all been in one, we all push the carts. People will, nowhere that we know of, will come out this way and push their cart around and get up to the parking field or come around this way to get up to the parking field. So this part of the retail faces into its parking field in an efficient manner, where cars work, which is the real life way people shop. This retail, again, faces east, but it has to, this parking field interfaces with the McDonald's that's existing with a leasing place for a long time. So we have to make all this interface work. So there's a lot of reason for a lot of what went in here as you as we get into some elevations, you'll see how these storefronts look in relation to the streets, and, and we tried to focus all we could to the streets and activate the streets, given the constraints we had of what each street is, what's next to the street, what easements we have to deal with, and how do we make that particular use work. Again, function, functional and cohesive are key words here. Any other questions on the side plan? I mean, it's nothing, as you can see, this is, this mass isn't a lot different than where we started. It's just reconfigured geom in the geometry and moved slightly to the south. We did spend a lot of time and effort on this site, which improving connectivity both auto and pedestrian. The site has a lot of things going on. Uh, obviously, the existing Malala uh, signal intersection has been improved as has the sidewalks and pedestrian connections off of Malala here. The Beaver Creek signal intersection has been improved. We've added sidewalks both up the west side, I'm sorry, up the west side and the east side of this drive. And these are all pedestrian plazas here, 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 and here, and I'll get into a little bit of what some of these are. But pedestrian access is everybody's hot button these days, and I think we've addressed it considerably. We've connected this end of the site with this end of the site with the pedestrian link. These north-south drives have been improved, are kind of in existence now, but have been improved both here and here, from Warner Milne all the way to Beaver Creek. The, just to give you some relative distances, this pedestrian link from the, the signal intersection to the corner of Safeway is about 240 feet. 
about a city block. This connection from Beaver Creek to the storefronts is about a 200 feet, again, about a city block. And a shortcut from, this is an existing transit station right here. I'm sorry, bus stop. And this connection back to the storefronts is about 160 feet. I think we've improved all of the north-south and east-west connectivity, both from an auto standpoint and from a pedestrian standpoint. And again, we spent a lot of time on this, and we continue to do so as we work through the issues here. What are we doing here? What are the buildings? This is the Safeway footprint of the building itself, and this is how our retail small shops work wrapping around the retail. Safeway entries are here. I think, I'm, I think they're here. I might be wrong. Here and here. Our entries are all over. We don't know exactly where they're going to be in the final orientation. We don't know how these stores are going to break out. But these shops have been designed so it's flexible. We can handle 800 foot tenants, we can handle 3,000 foot tenants, depending on how they want to break out and where their door is. But this is all storefront. Can you use the uh, mouse cursor to show us? Yeah, there you go. There you go. There's time before. That's the next. This is all storefront, basically, from here all the way. Down. See what happens? Technology. Don't push the button. From here all the way down to here. This is storefront. Let me go around again. This is all storefront. Safeway store is all basically activated storefront all the way across here. We designed this loading dock so this has also been we spent a lot of time on to get the movements off the road. A truck will come in the loading dock, pull forward, and back in. So any movement going on isn't backing traffic up into the Beaver Creek intersection. Um, let's talk about the footprint. Let's move on to the elevations. A lot of stuff going on here. We've got four elevations by two different architects, so half of what you see on both these pages is redundant. But uh, what this is really meant to show you is more of what's going on with the shop space. This is the bigger, the east elevation facing McDonald's of our shop space. Now, unfortunately, we don't know what the breakout of the tenants are going to be. So, this isn't necessarily identifying existing tenant spaces, it's just identifying the storefronts. This is the east. Where is this going? This is the east, and again, this is the south elevations. And what we had, what we used for kind of a palette was more of a sophisticated urban look. Um, we're trying to use timeless materials versus a lot of stuff that you see that's probably going to look dated. A lot of um, the stone veneers are kind of going, have been going on for about 10 years now. We think that's kind of a, a look that's going to, not in, in the very near future, is going to look like it happened in the first decade of the 2000s. We're trying to do more of a timeless urban look that will stand time, that will look fresh for a longer period of time than what a trendy kind of look you see now. It's flexible for multi tennis and it's meant to last a long time. The existing center was there for almost 40 years. We expect this to last at least 40 or 50 years. <coughs> um, Safeway's elevations. Again, there's a couple of, this is the uh, kind of important diagonal corner right at the Beaver Creek signal intersection. I think we've done a great job activating. This is the south elevation, and this is the screen wall on the west side of Safeway. Again, we've been having a lot of discussion about transparency in a screen wall. Think about that in a minute. But this is intended, and I'll show you what this looks like when we get into perspective here in a few minutes. But this is Safeway's front elevation. A lot of things going on. Uh, a lot of different signs for different, there's pharmacies in here, there's coffee in here. For sandwiches and plus the grocery store. Again, there are two main entries here and here. And a plaza, which I'll show you a little more of in a minute. Uh, Safeway is going to have a place where people can buy a sandwich and sit outside and eat it, or coffee, or wherever else you want to buy eat from the store. We, there's a few other plazas throughout the site we'll talk about as we get through the slides. Moving on to the next slide. 
A lot of our time with Tony and Pete has been looking at this particular intersection. This is the Beaver Creek signal intersection. And everybody's goal is activated. Um, we've got a lot of things going on. We talked about the easement, we talked about the dish, we talked about landscaping, we talked about natural resource areas. There's a lot of stuff going on here. And we tried very hard to activate what we're doing at this intersection. We think we've engaged the street, both the street coming into the center and the north south axis, as well as Beaver Creek. We think it has a very nice urban feel. Uh, from both the activated storefronts and what we're trying to do along the loading dock. It's pedestrian friendly, it's all at a pedestrian scale. There's a plaza right in this area here, we'll show you in a plan view here in a minute, that it's meant to work off in retail. There'll be places to sit, there'll be amenities there, bike parking and that sort of thing right in this area here. And we think it's inviting the visitors, uh, both automobile and pedestrians. And Beaver Creek is not a heavy pedestrian street at this time. Hopefully, when this is open, there will be more people, and I, I think it will be an inviting uh, place for them to come. This is, uh, if I put the landscape plan out, you see a lot of black, because at this area, you're not going to see much detail. But I think what I wanted to show you is how we really are improving this site. Uh, I think you can tell by the amount of green from here to here that we, we definitely added a ton of landscaping for where we're at now. It's a much more, again, coherent functional landscaping. It serves different purposes in different places, shading in the parking lot, screening along walls. Uh, we've managed to aggregate some larger pieces of landscaping here and along Beaver Creek. This is some of our mitigation area as well as some of what's going on in our natural resource area. Uh, a lot of planting, a lot of different, uh, there is no turf, but there are different grasses, foot high, two foot high grasses all through this area. Uh, again, the code is pretty specific about the number and types of trees which we will be meeting. Again, I can only really show you the contrast. There is a very detailed plan to show you that whatever symbol dies, is, she would want to see it. Um, the plan, there's basically four different plans on the site. Uh, these kind of illustrate, and this is at the, the northeast corner. Uh, this is a point, and this is the edge of our shops. So this area will be activated with a pedestrian plaza. This is at the south or southwest corner of Safeway at the Beaver Creek entry. And again, this plaza will be activated with seating and amenities and bike parking and everything that to support the plaza. Hopefully interacting with a food tenant somewhere along this space. We've also built a small little plaza to connect this, I know it's missing from the, the site, but this is the transit station along Beaver Creek. It connects back to the sidewalk system with a gravel path. Uh, uh, I think it's decomposed granite, back to the sidewalk system, and then up to the storefronts. So these are the three paths other than Safeway. And Safeway has, has, has a rather large plaza, an activated uh, storefront. This is their plaza with trellises and windscreens. Uh, there's plenty of other trees and planters and urns and ashtrays and other tables for seating all along the interface between Safeway and the big parking fields of the north. So in the end, oh, I think I have one more, I'm sorry. I guess, oh, sorry, I have, this is the last slide. In the end, I, I think we've accomplished a lot of the goals of your code as well as addressing some of the challenges of the site. We're, uh, I like doing redevelopment. I, I think whether, regardless of lease certification or not, there's nothing greener than redeveloping existing sites. The infrastructure's here, the street grid is here, in a lot of cases the pavement's here. We're actually taking, the, there's actually a net loss of impervious pavement with our redevelopment from its existing state. And local investment and the fact that we're redeveloping an existing site to provide a neighborhood amenity that's been on this site for 40 years, I think it's a pretty nice thing to add to your neighborhood. And hopefully you'll look at that, look at that and take that into account as you get to the final decision. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, is there any questions to the applicant? I have questions about um, how the phasing relates to um, the um, 
the thinking of this project relates to the existing properties that are there that have leases on them that uh, prevent activities going on immediately. You had a slide, the detailed development plan slide, I think, where you showed the ditch. There was a second slide, I think, you showed, maybe the third. What I'm curious about is you talked about the interface between those uh, those properties or those those locations and and this project. So I'm wondering what's happened with those interfaces. Could you talk about those interfaces? Are they hard interfaces? Um, is there work being done at the interface? Could you just talk about? I'm specifically thinking of the east and the north side. There's obviously a whole lot of things going on. There's a lot of different tenants, a lot of different existing uh, leasehold interests. Some of them are long term, some of them probably have a shorter horizon. So we can't say with exact certainty about some of them how those might lay out in terms of a long term ground lease. Some of it depends on whether or not the tenant decides to stick around. But I think if you look um, at some of the sites that we've identified for the earlier phases, so down in the corner pad, um, and Mark, you can correct me if I'm wrong here. Uh, so that's not all contingent on on changes in the leasehold interest. Um, the one, the restaurant pad, obviously, there's nothing there. Well, there, are, there are no issues. Here. So as a as a future phase, um, you know, that's open. That's just a matter of market demand. But you know, as soon as there's market demand, that we find a suitable tenant, then we'd be ready to activate that that site right there. The next site over here. And I guess the reason I'm curious is um, I'm, I'm wondering, are, we're approving the master plan for all phases, and if that's the case, I'm wondering that's a good question. So, who are the other details? We're trying to detail development plan on just the white area, so that's why we're looking at the more substantive and detailed code criteria. Okay. In this gray area, we'd be coming back in for site plan review, and you'd get another shot at looking at the more detailed. Thank you. Yeah. I've got a question. Um, my, my question, so this is, uh, this is done by late 2011, and, and when, we, when we, the master plan, the, the idea of the master plan for Oregon City is you get this, you know, two to, or two to, or five to, two to 40 year window. And I guess my question relates actually, what, what's the vision? I can see that. I can see it's really being humanized. I mean, there's just lots of really wonderful things, it seems like, around the safe way with planters and active spaces and restaurants at the corner. Um, but what's the, what's the urban planning kind of ideas? I mean, these are past, you know, projects like this in cities like Oregon, all across Oregon City, all across America are kind of confronted with this. They need a whole new look and a whole new feel to them. And I'm just wondering what that vision is. And I understand leases too, and how that could all, but that, that's just part of it too. Um, whether that you know whether they exercise their lease or they don't, I'm just wondering how this will fit in in 20 years. Like, what's the what's the what's the what's the vision there? Well, I think you know the probably the map that speaks a lot is to part of what you're talking about is the connectivity. There's all you can do. With what you have is try to provide so future phases will connect to what you do and meet the goals of the community at that time. And you know, there's sidewalks in some cases on both sides of the street, or there are places where if something happens on the north side of this uh, project. There are ways to connect it to the south side. And your your question is tough. I mean, it's tough. As long as there's big sites, it's always a tough challenge. And you know, you're always from a from a landlord standpoint. I'm not the landlord here, but you, know, you can wait and you can wait. But the other side of waiting is blight, because it never all comes together perfectly on these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And this this is not just this any retail, any place. And part of what's causing this is you know, larger tenants are on ground leases. Which means, for the most part, the larger tenants are investing the money in the building. And to invest the money in the building, you need a long enough lease term to make that investment justified, because they're mostly special purpose buildings. And it, it's a tough, tough challenge. There's no question about it. Mm -hmm. okay. If I might add, just 
one thought additionally. I mean, we're obviously creating, and I think you just sort of said the same thing, a, a specific urban character to the part that we're touching today. Mm -hmm. And as Mark is saying, we're going to connect that with more connectivity in the future, but we'll be able to connect that aesthetically as well with urban scale and pedestrian amenities and a similar look so that the shop the shopping center just becomes more and more cohesive as the opportunity for redevelopment occurs. And, you know, even though some of these may be longer out, we also know that in the short term, we're still going to have opportunities for redevelopment. And that's the chance for us to capitalize on that opportunity. Okay. Well, plus our code, really, if you, if you have looked at our code, <laughs> and we certainly have, <laughs> um, our code will, you know, this development, long-term development, it, it, will, um, it will have to change because our code does not allow what's there now. Mm -hmm. So it's, you will, we'll see a lot of possible, a lot of positive changes in my mind. Um, regardless, you know, whatever happens as it goes through whatever lease tenants or however that works out. Uh, I think we'll see that just start meeting our urban code that we have developed as a group here. So I think we'll see some real positive things from that. We'll get another bite. And, you know, just because we're approving a master plan, we keep saying all these other redevelopments will have to be in front of this board with a land use application. So it's not that you're giving up the right to, to you know, enforce those codes on other parts of this property, you just can't do it now. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to talk about master plans a little bit, and, and you probably know, and I hope you know, because you probably plan this into your trap studies, but the county is, has a master plan as well, and they've got many new buildings planned for that area up there in their master plan. Um, I'm looking at this a little concerned about the pedestrians coming from the county area from the shot from that from that whole side of uh, Upper Beaver Creek coming down that way. It, it appears to me from the, the picture I saw of that intersection there that it's not a lighted intersection. And it, it, it concerns me a little bit that, yeah. That's what you say, that is. It is. Okay. It is. Okay. That is. Okay. Well, that, that helps a lot. That helps a lot. <laughs> it was kind of blocking what we were trying to show us when we left it off. No, that's okay. But, I mean, that's, I, I, I was off one, I think, is what I was doing. Because I was thinking that was the back. Yeah. So, so that's good. I mean, that's the thing that, that I had issue with is that, you know, make sure that we have plenty of pedestrian access. Um, and that's a busy street and we'll continue to get busier. And, and uh, a lot of people, will hopefully, you know, will be using this amenity. The other question I had relates to that, um, that, that main access way um, that would walk along. Uh, how, a couple questions. How wide is that sidewalk? Does it long, walk along the building as you're heading back towards the truck parking or truck delivery area? And are, is it going to be a, a, a marked area for pedestrians as they cross in front of that truck parking area? And where is the backup truck parking area? Because if you've ever been around a grocery store in the morning, you have 400 delivery trucks, and they're all parking wherever they can park. Uh, it, and it seems to me you're, you get two trucks in that parking area, and you're going to be backed up. So two questions about pedestrians, and then also backup on your parking. Um, Barry, are you back there? Can you answer that question? Yeah, the uh, side Can you, can you come up to a microphone, please? Thanks. <coughs> Both sides of the, the west end, what we call the west entry into the property off of Beaver Creek Road, um, the sidewalks are, are 10 feet plus. Um, they have street, street trees and wells every 35 feet or so. And so when you, you are northbound <clears throat> going up the west elevation of Safeway, there's a gridded uh, concrete sidewalk that continues all the way through the throat uh, for the truck access and then gets to a, an additional raised sidewalk as, as you move to the north. Okay. Oh, yeah, I can see that. So there's, there's two opportunities for pedestrians. Um, I happen to think that a lot of the pedestrians are going to come across the crosswalk from the south side of Beaver Creek Road, and they'll probably continue up that west side. And then when you get to what we're calling our intersection, uh, there's articulated gridded uh, crosswalks in all four directions that allows you to um, you know, turn right and go to the east up into, into Safeway and also to continue north 
um, up to the 25, what we call the 25K retail building that's existing. Okay, and, and at those at those gridded crosswalks that you have there, uh, there and then on the east side as well, are those uh, have the roads have stop signs, four-way stop signs to slow traffic at, at those points? Yeah, the one that's at the east right now, we're not calling for a stop sign. Um, well, that that's the west one. That will be a four-way stop. That's the way we have it currently. Uh, the one as you move east, keep going this way, that one right there, um, that's a raised crosswalk right now. And our thought was that would create a uh, traffic calming at that point without creating a stop, um, which we thought, and I, we haven't gone over this with Chris Bramer uh, yet, but there's a potential there if, if it makes sense from a safety standpoint to make that a stop. Um, I'm a little bit concerned with the traffic that comes in from Malala through there, so we thought raising that crosswalk would be the best way. Um, as we move to the center crosswalk, the kind of Safeways parking field over to the store, that one's um, also articulated with a, a scored uh, concrete path, but it's flush with, with the asphalt. And I think it's just saying, I think it'd be, it'd be you know, a raceway, yeah, really. Yeah. And, and I, if you can, if you can minimize that, and I, I'm not a big fan of speed bumps or or or, 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 or race, uh, pedestrian ways, but in some cases like that stretch, which I, is the length of the building, which right. might not be a bad idea. Our, our original scheme was to have sort of a, a flush plaza all the way through uh, to move from the sidewalk in front of Safeway, moving north to their parking field. But as we've gone through this process, everybody felt it would be, be better um, that we actually do a six-inch curb there and that would create a better uh, safety, uh, physical safety um, uh, environment for uh, patrons of the store. Well, and I wouldn't even really, I, I'd even consider maybe even put, um, uh, you know, stop signs at that center, at that center point, uh, you know, to slow traffic from point to point. I, I know it's a, a pain, but, you know, right. we you got a lot of people crossing through there. It just seems to me, and that's your number. One, that's your, your major parking field. It makes right. sense to have that, have that least people slowing down in some way, in some fashion. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. No. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, there's always a lot more information coming to us. Um, at this time, we've got a lot of people here, and we have some uh, cards from people. Uh, uh, Mr. Maybe. Uh, Chair Powell and Commissioners, my name is William Gifford, and I live in Oregon City, and I serve as the Land Use Chair for the Glendale Neighborhood Association. Are you speaking on behalf of the neighborhood? Yes, I am. Um, the neighborhood uh, did submit a letter regarding the orientation of the building towards the parking lot, and the neighborhood has no objections to that whatsoever. I understand that the code would prefer the building face Beaver Creek, but the way it's set up now, we have no objections to that whatsoever. We think that that's probably the best use of the uh, this use of the parking lot, understanding that that is a uh, is a grocery store. People typically go from a parking field. I've got to learn that language. I've always called it a parking lot. A parking field directly into the grocery store, and to go around the other side seems a little peculiar to us. So uh, that is certainly supports the orientation of that. Um, we also had a discussion about. What, what you, Chair Powell, had called a raceway and the concern about that and the fact that they have put in the raised uh, pedestrian crossings and so on, that's, that's pretty nice. I had sort of imagined that that wasn't a street shot through um, because right now when you stand on Molala, you can see all the way in a straight line all the way down to the movie theater. But um, I'm just going to have to trust that they know what they're doing insofar as slowing down traffic. When you mentioned those stop signs, I couldn't help but think of uh, Fred Meyer, um, 
there is there is another issue that came up, and um, I've been told that Pete will find a way of seeing what uh, what code this applies to. Um, and he says, just go ahead and make whatever comments you want. One of the comments that we have is very specifically about landscaping. And just as, as a bit of background, uh, a couple of years ago, when I was chair of the McLaughlin Neighborhood Association, the McLaughlin Neighborhood had applied for a grant to place a large tree in the Carnegie Park for shade, especially for concerts in the park. And as I recall, the neighborhood was prepared to come up with a couple thousand dollars or so uh, as a uh, is matching funds. You put in a large tree. And then, unfortunately, that uh, pool, or that uh, the grant application was denied. But now we see an opportunity here. There are a lot of trees on this particular site, and the existing plan calls for removing a lot of them. So let me. I, I have five points that I would like to make from the neighborhood. Number one is we would like to keep as many trees and shrubs in place as possible. Uh, for example, that tree island. Do that. This one? Ah, yeah. Coming right along here, there is an existing island of trees. Actually, that's where it is. There. It's been moved over a couple of feet so they can put in diagonal parking along there. But on your dais. Exhibit 4 is the tree preservation plan. Um, if you want to take a look at that. Sorry, Lou. My, my, I'm, this is sort of a semi educated guess is the number of mature trees in there. And we really like the, the, the feeling of mature, plea, of mature trees. It, it gives so much more character to a site and to a neighborhood to have mature trees around. Those are significantly mature trees. And to Rip them out just to move it over a couple of feet. It does seem to be a shame when it could be uh, by crowding this side over here. I'm not sure what the proper line issues are along here, but there's right now a lot of tan uh, junipers. Those could be ripped out, put in a retaining wall, and keep those mature trees. That's one of the suggestions that we had. Uh, Item number two was to use as many trees and shrubs as must be removed on the existing site. That is to say, if you have to tear down a tree on this site, why not place it someplace else on the site? Some of these trees we understand are too large that they're, that they're just going to have to be firewood. And that's kind of a shame. And some of them aren't as healthy as they ought to be. And so those are just going to be firewood. But those that are healthy, mature trees, it seems to me as though they ought to be reused on the existing site. Uh, for example, the storm drain mitigation plan calls for multiple new Oregon white oaks. That's all along here. Uh, however, those uh, the leaves of those trees decompose slowly and could cause blockages of the drains. And I think maybe some of you remember a couple of years ago when those drains got blocked and it flooded all the way across Deaver Creek. We don't want to see that happen again. Uh, there's multiple choices of other trees already existing on the site that could be moved over there. I would think it's considerable uh, savings to the, uh, to the developer as well. Point number three is what large trees must be removed and are not suitable for use elsewhere on the existing site should be investigated for suitability as shade trees for Carnegie Park. Carnegie Park needs trees. These trees have to be removed anyway. Couldn't we work up some sort of a deal that uh, those trees could be moved to a more productive use for the city um, rather than just destroying them? Point four, what large shade trees that are not suitable for Carnegie Park, as well as other shrubs which must be moved, should be investigated for suitability as shade trees and shrubs in other existing Oregon City parks? Why not? Parks Department needs trees. We, we're trying to develop a new, uh, the extension of the um, Oakley, Wesley Lynn Park. That's looking for expansion there. There's going to be a need for trees and shrubs there. Uh, we just bought the new park down at, um, on Glen Oak in the Coffield Neighborhood Association. Uh, that's going to be needing some new trees and so on. So why not consider taking those trees and using them somewhere else in the city? Uh, and the last point was the trees and shrubs which cannot be moved immediately should be stored for later plantings. Possibilities for storage include the property directly behind the existing police station. That's the area over here. Uh, there's plenty of storage space there, and it wouldn't be too expensive, I wouldn't think, to just, I mean, it have to be dug up anyway. 
with a little more care that could be dug up carefully and, uh, and stored somewhere. Uh, they could be put in the undeveloped portion of Hollandale Park or the newly acquired parkland off the of South Oak Road. Um, so those are just some concerns that we had about what to do with that landscaping. On the whole, we're tickled silly with the design. I think the neighborhood has been anxious to have this site redeveloped for a long time. I know that some neighbors are really surprised that this process takes such a long time, but we understand there are a lot of details. But we are anxious to see this, uh, this development go forward. We're, uh, the neighborhood is fully behind the development. We want it to happen. We would like something to be done with uh, all, the, uh, all the landscaping that is there now. Those are the only comments that I had. I have any, any questions? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Larry. Maybe. Fishers, uh, David Maybe. I am the chair of the McLaughlin Neighborhood Association. I'm here speaking with that uh, hat on. Um, and it has to do with one of the points that Mr. Gifford made, which is the idea that some of those trees in on the site might be usable for Carnegie Park. Um, as you mentioned, a couple years ago, uh, we did make an application to have large, larger than uh, starter trees put in place because the uh, elms in place have been slowly dying from Dutch elm disease. And uh, it's a mature park, and we'd like to see something other than, you know, willow twigs stuck back in the hole. We'd like something that's functional. Uh, walking around the site uh, this weekend, I noticed that there were several trees that were uh, potential transplants, including English elms, which are uh, uh, not, uh, which are resistant to the Dutch elm disease. Uh, they're right up against the side of the building on the library side, which I guess is the north elevation. Um, and if you just look at them, they look kind of funny because they're basically half under the awning, so they've got like, it looks like half a tree. Um, but uh, it's been my recollection that uh, there's a couple of options there. One, they could be utilized uh, at Carnegie near the building because they're already one-sided. The other thing is they could be planted back to back and they will grow together and you end up with one mature tree out of two. Uh, people are laughing, but it works. Um, but it, 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 those are multiple opportunities for uh, trees on site. Um, they're in uh, planters, so they have small root balls that does make them uh, very uh, uh, transplantable. Um, but also some lindens that are going to be uh, taken out when the plaza to the, on the Beaver Creek side is put in. Um, and those are, again, deciduous trees that fit the, 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 uh, the site. There's a couple of evergreens, but it's not, Carnegie isn't an evergreen park. So um, what we were able to uh, get out to the steering committee and feedback from them is that we would love to, uh, to see that opportunity. Um, and I, I don't know if there's such a thing as, as that, but it seems like you would, uh, it would be an, an opportunity for some mitigation credit. I mean, the trees are still, would still be in the, the city's canopy, uh, whether they're moved you know, over to uh, the drainage ditch or whether they're moved to Carnegie Park, they're still part of the, uh, the urban forest and they're still uh, productive. So it seems that some sort of a mitigation credit would be useful rather than just 15 tiny trees when you can have real trees out there. Sure. So that's it. Good. Thank you. Have any other requests to speak or anyone like to speak at the stand? Sure, come on forward. Just introduce yourself and tell your city residents. My name is Lydia Bugatti. I live in Westland, but I have the guy's restaurant there at the very end of the shopping center. And I just wanted to point out that I love the way they designed this because it includes businesses. I was very concerned that I might be kind of forgotten over in my little corner, but the orientation of the buildings, uh, the pattern flow, and it's just, it's beautifully done. Um, I just wanted to point that out, how I felt. It sounds like the safe with specials coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice having some place quick to duck over for a little bit of basil. Or bread. That's, that's a direct shot. <laughs> so, that was really what I wanted to say. Great, thank you. Very good, thank you. Thank you. 
Anyone else? All right. Well, it, it appears that uh, no one else wants to speak. So um, we're going to leave the um, leave this open um, for further uh, discussion and, and well, we'll discuss that, but um, we'll leave the, uh, the public hearing open. So if there's any other discussion or any other things you would want to be uh, submitted, you can certainly do that, and uh, we can go into the uh, details of that. Um, uh, I do want to give an opportunity to ask you to come back up if you want to rebut anything you heard. No? Okay. Uh, we'll have another, more opportunity certainly for that. Um, so, it's at this point, we are requesting that you do leave the record open. Um, so, the next hearing would be November 8th. Um, and so, we kind of gave you the general description of the, of the development and the proposal at this time. Uh, if you have any questions of us that you'd like us to take back and, and work on prior to that next hearing, you know, feel free to do so tonight. Or if you want to send those in, you can certainly put those into the record. Um, if something does come to you as you start working through this material. Um, we will have the staff report out on uh, November 1st. So that'll be one week prior, and you'll be getting that information. Um, what we're what we're envisioning is that um, we'll have all the information. Uh, there may be some some updates to, to the to some of the pages that you have in your documents, and we'll, we'll point those out to you when we when we forward them. And then we'll also obviously present the staff report with the conditions of approval. We'll be prepared at that time. Um, what we will do is, you know, you'll see when you get it, it's a, it's a rather lengthy, lengthy document because you remember we are looking at a master plan for the whole site with multiple phases, and then the actual detailed development plan for the first phase of development, which is the Safeway store and the surrounding retail and the, and the upgrades to the parking lots and, and the, some of the pedestrian amenities and whatnot. So, so you, you, you've got two approvals that you're, that you're working through, the concept plan and then the actual, the, the more detailed development plan. And what goes along with that is the Natural Resource Overlay District. And so when we make our presentation, um, obviously, if you have any questions about anything in the staff report, we're going to try and identify what we think are the key issues for you to focus on as they relate to our code approval criteria, laying out any of the adjustments that you're allowed to do through the, uh, through the master plan process and the mitigation that's proposed to, to meet the intent of the code. Um, so we may miss something that is important to you or that you need more clarification on or have questions about, so please feel free to ask those questions either call me or email or we can do it at the hearing that night as well. Um, so with that, once again, the record is the record is open. It will remain open until we decide to, until the commission decides to close it. Um, well, it is, the next year. I would like to ask um, if staff and if um, yeah, the commissioners agree here, I, I would be interested in looking at the feasibility of, of removing and replacing trees. Um, I, I mean, I, I like the idea of, of doing that, and I just I, it'd be it'd be nice to have somebody look at those trees if they haven't already, and determine if they can be moved. If there's a feasible way that they can be moved, that they will do. I, I, there's no sense going to a lot of expense to move trees that won't make it. Um, so small root ball trees, I don't think that'd be a problem. But some of the other trees, I think it'd be I, I'd be interested to get that in, in place. So we can I think um, we'll talk with. Uh, uh, Mr. Archer from our park director. You know, I, I believe that we do have a Carnegie planting plan, and there are some opinions out there about because of the Dutch elm disease that does exist, that does exist out there, um, the appropriateness of putting elms there, even if they are resistant. There are some concerns uh, from some arborists on that. Um, you know, we have multiple public properties and parks throughout the city, so we will. We'll have a discussion with the applicant and, and look into that for you. I, I and I, it'd be nice if you could respond. That'd be great. So, and with the other folks who spoke on that tonight, mm -hmm. it'd be nice to get their input because I know that they probably have spoken with uh, Scott, but if not, that that'd be another discussion that they should have so they can express their concern about that. Well, and and since we're looking at the plants, I know that we have our plant list. Is there a section of that list or a tick mark on that list that identifies edibles? No, I believe it's organized according to habitat types. Is it uh, possible to get that breakout? Uh, we can certainly try. At, at least no, edible edible plants on our plant list? Yeah. We're talking about edible by people or animals. Existing or proposed? <laughs> no, I, I, I think it may. There's uh, been a comment from Jackie Hammond Williams. 
yeah. um, that asks us to take seriously the idea of using edible plants. And I'd like the body to take that suggestion seriously. Yeah. It's not a joke. Thank you. Any other, uh, any other comments for staff? Any direction you want to hear now? Well, the, the one thing I, I had a comment, I, I wanted to join uh, Commissioner Powell's uh, issue about the uh, experience as you enter the site at the south from Beaver Creek Road and as you're passing that loading area. Uh, I think some more detail on that would be uh, helpful. Uh, exactly what that pedestrian experience would be like. Is it going to be just like walking by a loading dock, or is it going to be more special than that? Uh, and then I, uh, I heard him ask a question. I didn't hear a response. Uh, what the uh, plan would be for dealing with uh, overflow parking for trucking? Uh, it, the, the loading dock, here's the screen. Uh, for two, two trucks, but if you had half a dozen trucks uh, waiting in line to get there, where, where do they park? What's the staging area for that? Uh, so I, I think that would be uh, nice to have uh, some information on that. Uh, and I'd be curious also as part of that to understand what the anticipated experience would be for that future uh, tab that would be across from the uh, loading dock development. So there's at some point, uh, will be a, another retail element there facing that loading dock area. So it would be nice to understand what they're going to be looking at. Is that clear and everybody's good on that? Okay. All right. So uh, then at this point, if there's no further discussion, I'm open for a motion. I motion we continue this until the November 8th hearing. Do I have a second? We have a motion and a second. The commission is wrong. Tony? Commissioner Stein. Aye. Commissioner Lejois? Aye. Commissioner Kidwell? Aye. Sure, Paul? Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you in November. Thanks very much for coming. Appreciate it.